Hi, and welcome to another Earth Refuge Faces interview. My name is Aubrey Calloway, and today I'm talking with Ruth Miller, who will be talking to us about her incredible work as a Native climate justice organizer. And before we get started, I also wanted to acknowledge that the land where I am located right now is the ancestral and unceded traditional territories of the Atacapa Ishak people. So Ruth, can you go ahead and introduce yourself a little bit more for us? Um, hello everyone, my English name is Ruth Miller, my Den Ina Athabasca name is Shavaik Isen, and I'm a member of the Chukhyang tribe of Dillingham, uh, though my family and I are Den Ina Athabascan from the Lake Cork area. Um, I grew up here on Den Ina homelands in Degeyakak, otherwise known as Anchorage, Alaska. Now you she, her pronouns, and at the moment I work as the climate justice director for a grassroots matriarchal indigenous organizing nonprofit called Native Movement. Wonderful. And can you give us a little bit insight into what that work entails? I can certainly try. I just um, challenged myself to chronicle one of my crazy Google Calendar days on, uh, on my Instagram. And it, well, it was only when I had to kind of take myself meeting by meeting that I realized all of the different myriad approaches to climate justice that um, that can fit into a day that complement the work of a week um, and that have to be given attention and love in order to move a movement forward. And so here on a local level, um, I would say that a huge priority of the work that I do in climate justice organizing um, within the state is both uh, with our tribal leadership and our tribal and rural communities working to elevate and uplift stories from the land, from our people, stories not just of subsistence and, and cultural knowledges, but um, thinking about narratives that uh, elevate our um, ancestral wisdoms into present climate dialogues. Um, so turning to our tribal leadership and our community land-based knowledge to inform what climate adaptation policy looks like and what mitigation strategies look like, uh, but also to ensure that it's our tribal voices and our uh, rural voices that are centered in advocacy work um, and in environmental and conservation movements as well. Uh, from a broader scale, that means taking some of these uh, frameworks about, you know, uh, moving from an extractive economy to a regenerative economy, something that we call just transition, and indigenizing it, bring, uh, challenging these frameworks to also be reflective of the people they are hoping to represent. Um, and so that also means uh, that advocacy for climate justice includes intervening in the environmental and conservation uh, sphere and encouraging our partners there, often whom are very well resourced from out of state, uh, often whom are, are run by folks who might not be indigenous to Alaska to work on what decolonization within their climate movements look like. So that we're not just talking about addressing climate change, but we're talking about pursuing climate justice. And so by incorporating a justice framework that thinks about racial justice, gender justice, and environmental justice in tandem with one another, we can ensure that this future we're advocating for is holistic, is well, and it's inclusive of all peoples as it elevates our frontline uh, voices first and foremost. So in state, that also um, means we have to think about those principles and values frameworks that are infused in the policy we advocate for. So when we approach legislation, uh, both on a, on a state and national level, um, such as the work that I've been doing recently with the Green New Deal and the Thrive Agenda through the Green New Deal Network, we're also bringing those same lessons from the land, the same lessons that I learned, you know, sitting with my elders and talking story deep into the night into our national policy fights. Um, the Thrive Agenda has been a big push recently um, over the past few months as the most recent iteration of a justice-oriented uh, economic stimulus package that would push for economic recovery, specifically supporting investments in frontline communities and communities of color. Um, and so, you know, from 
a phone call with some elders talking about, you know, what these pieces of policy look like in our communities to, you know, phone calls with senators and representatives. Of course, everything's a phone call now. Um, there's this through line of always bringing us back to the land and always bringing us back to the people. So even when you go farther than that, um, and when I have the privilege to organize um, internationally around the Global Climate Accords and uh, often with the United Nations, um, it is always that same task of bringing us back to our roots and, and bringing, um, bringing the, the methodologies of these very high level elite and inaccessible places back down to our people, um, where our true leadership lies, where our true understanding of place lies, where our most ancestral knowledges of what wellness and community looks like um, are and in that way we can ensure that the policies and the politics that we're advocating for will return us back to that holistic wellness that our people um, have always known and loved. And what inspired you to pursue this work in the first place? Well I don't ever feel that I had much of a choice and I say that in a, in a happy way and in a you know, an, 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 an authentically true way. I was raised by two Native American rights lawyers. My father is Ashkenazi Jewish from New York and um, has done an incredible amount of work for decades on behalf of Native American tribes as an ally. Um, whereas my mother is a Native American woman, um, also a lawyer who um, found herself in the same advocacy work through a very different pathway and a very different journey. But what was so powerful being raised by the two of them um, later in life, my, my parents are elders now, um, was watching this deep interplay and the way that they would partner together, whether it was you know to write the same briefs or to talk to someone from this perspective and this perspective, the synchronicity and the way that they would orchestrate their different contributions um, and utilize uh, the different skill sets that they both brought to the table to advocate for the same forms of justice for tribal nations was so deeply inspiring to me. Um, and so when my niece, uh, who I was raised with as a sister, um, when we would sit at our dining room table, you know, we didn't really have the luxury <laughs> of having kid time. We heard about the most recent cases and briefs that my parents were advocating for. Um, but so, so I was, you know, had the privilege of being primed um, in that way and being, you know, I guess educated at home uh, on how important it is for us to use our voices and how um, it is shameful to, um, to be a passive bystander to injustice and how um, we cannot afford um, within our souls and within our communities to be complicit in the types of injustice and degradation that our peoples and our lands are facing today. And so as I went through college and, and um, later, you know, well, before then <laughs> began my, my working career and then of course continued it after, um, I never really felt that I had a choice, particularly as an indigenous woman, um, because the work of climate justice is the work of advocating for my own human rights. It's the work of advocating for my own environmental rights and those such rights for all of the people that I care about and love here in my home. So wouldn't it be great if I could be an artist um, artists are integral to the movement. You know, wouldn't it be great if I could be a musician? You know, mu music is what brings us life, right? But I know that I have both the privilege and the responsibility to dedicate as much time and life energy as I can um, to ensuring that my children will have that opportunity to follow their greatest joys and passions. So I'm curious what... Um climate-induced or related displacement has looked like or other forms of displacement that indigenous communities throughout history have experienced? How does that play into how you think about climate justice? Well, you know, I'll, I'll of course speak from an Alaska perspective. It's, it's the only one I can speak from. Um, 
And it's interesting because because when I heard the first part of your question, of course, I thought, well, we have all all of these you know dozens of different markers that we're experiencing here in the Arctic and the circumpolar north that are the impacts of of climate change that are devastating our communities, whether it's erosion from our riverbanks and our um, coasts into the ocean because of rising tides, or it's the battering of our coastal villages because sea ice is no longer protecting them from winter storms, or whether it's our salmon dying in our river of heat stroke um, because of warming temperatures. Um, I could go on and on, and I will. But once I listen to the second part of your question, you know, the if we're taking a historical approach, it's true that our communities are at the front lines of climate chaos today, but not only because we're most vulnerable, but because we have always lived closest with the land. And from a historical approach, our first climate crisis was colonization. When settlers came to our lands and attempted to supplant our traditions, they attempted to eradicate our languages, attempted to to annihilate our people, and in many cases were successful. Our first climate crisis was the introduction of an ideology and a monotheistic religion that um, began teaching that humans are above nature. Um, they are above and a part of nature and different than the natural world, and that our souls are disconnected from the spirits of our lands and our waters and our airs and our planet and animal relatives. So our first, climate catastrophe um, was not only um, the destruction of our lands and waters that came with settlement and the industrial revolution and the ways that our people were forced off of our ancestral territories for the sake of resource extraction um, to serve other populations um, hellbent on <laughs> destroying our lands, um, but it was also a crisis of ideology. It was a crisis of spirit that came um, when um, assimilation policies of the US federal government attempted to disrupt our ancestral connection with our homelands and with our ancestors um, and with the earth that we had always known and loved. Luckily, in, in many ways, they were unsuccessful. But unfortunately, we also have that experience of trauma that our people are still carrying today. And we live with that burden that we are trying to heal even now. It is that you know burden of pain. It was that first climate catastrophe that um, has induced us to a poverty that we never knew before. Um, we never were, were materialistic societies that held currency as a form of wealth. And even now for many of our people, you know, wealth is having a full freezer of our subsistence foods, our foods from the land. And so this climate catastrophe um, began with, with a, uh, a disruption in uh, an ideology that was rooted not in reciprocity, but was rooted in selfishness. It wasn't rooted in community, it was rooted in individualism. And so when we think about the climate crisis now, we have to remember that colonization was not an event, it was and is an ongoing process. And so if we hope to see um, climate solutions that seriously, that, that seriously and intentionally bring us back into right relationship with our earth, it's not just about bringing our global temperature down a few degrees, it is about fundamentally changing the way that we relate to one another and to our lands and waters um, and the responsibilities that we see uh, between our humans and non-human relatives. And um, that has to be at the core of any policy that attempts to ameliorate the climate crisis now is thinking about the foundations of the climate crisis, which was not just the past few years when you know, Western science has begun to notice the devastating impacts of, of what we have already done. It has to go back to our indigenous scientists that have always seen changes coming because we've lived with and for the lands for millennia. It has to go back to our indigenous wisdom keepers who still tell us stories of their boarding schools um, and the ways that they were disenfranchised emotionally, spiritually, mentally, and physically uh, from their relationship with land and their cultures. And so it's, it's really a, a holistic healing process that we are being called to, uh, to solve the climate crisis. 
I know you um, think and talk a lot about wellness and how, like what part that plays in climate justice. Can you tell me a little bit more about that? Well, um, when you live closely with the land, you begin to understand that um, the health of our animals and plants, the health of our waters is the health of our bodies. And not just in a spiritual way, although that connection is strong and powerful, but when we begin to, um, for instance, see increasing um, mercury and, and toxins in the bodies of our fish, in our watersheds, in the mar marrow of our caribou bones, which is now turning black. And when you think about the impacts of, uh, impacts on the bodies of the communities that still subsist off of these animals, like I do, that's what my freezer is full of, then we also begin to correlate increasing rates of cancer, increasing rates of respiratory health problems, uh, birth defects, infertility, um, a huge number of acute health impacts on our native peoples um, in proximity to development projects on our lands that are causing these toxins to, to leach into our um, food systems. And so in a deeply physical way, we know that the poisoning of our food resources is devastating our communities. And it is often the most remote, most rural, most vulnerable peoples that are, that are um, experiencing this burden first and foremost. And it's their voices that are so often ignored. So from a deeply, you know, from, from a, a clearly physical level, we are living the impacts of the climate crisis because the same mines, the same uh, resource extraction sites, the same oil fields that are fueling this feedback cycle of uh, climate change um, and greenhouse gas emission and um, that are, of course, in the Arctic, amplified at at least four times the rate as the rest of the world. Well, we're seeing the direct impacts on the communities that live Within, uh, within the region of these resource extraction projects. And so for one, I mean, that, that, that causation is undeniable. But if you look deeper, you also see the ways that, um, again, the ideology of resource extraction and the indirect impacts are also disproportionately affecting our communities. And most tragically, we see this with our missing and murdered indigenous women. We see a remarkable and devastating um, increase in violence against our women, in disappearance of our women, rape and violation of our women in proximity to development projects. And our relatives in so-called Canada know this as well. Around development projects um, to support uh, this resource extraction, oftentimes these companies require huge amounts of low wage labor. And instead of employing local communities would rather ship in workers from other oil states like Texas and Tennessee um, to, uh, to, you know, do the, do the, to, to provide the manpower uh, for this resource extraction. But as they are extracting the bloodlines of our earth, these man camps are also preying predominantly on our native women. And we see a disproportionate rise um, in violence against our women around these development projects. Um, and it is, and for that reason, native women are the most, um, the most aggressed against demographic in the United States. Um, with such little publicity and such little uh, public understanding and knowledge, let alone, you know, state or federal support. Um, and so our connection to, to our lands, you know, we say, um, you know, defend the sacred, defend our lands, waters, bodies, because we know they are all one and the same. They are so deeply interconnected that we can't do one without defending the others. And when it comes to that 
defense of land and body and community, how does um, displacement or the desire to stay kind of, what does that tension look like? Are there threats of these communities having to move elsewhere? It's already happening in Alaska. We have some of the first uh, climate refugees in the United States. Uh, we have a number of coastal villages um, that have spent decades, truly decades, uh, in litigation uh, against the state and federal government um, seeking uh, seeking financing and support to relocate entire villages to oftentimes abandon ancestral sites um, and to and to find new means of sustaining a community. Um, you know, the, the communities of Kivalina and Nutak come to mind. Nutak just in the past year began their relocation process across the way to Martarvik. Um, and that was a multi-million dollar endeavor that they, they had to pursue. Um, you know, a small tribal government had to advocate loudly enough to garner enough grants to band-aid together support for their community. But this you know, conceptually also has to be addressed. Our people were, were largely nomadic. Um, we moved with the seasons and this is not, you know, just thousands of years ago, Alaska only became a state in the 1950s. And so when you think about our history of colonization and the way that we know how to live with the land and the way that we know how to be successful um, in community is not, uh, it's, it's just not synonymous with the way that uh, we are expected and coerced into living today. And so going back to one of the examples that I used, uh, Kivalina is a really, really important, um, important community to understand and to be in solidarity with. Um, this community uh, was, it, it, Kivalina village, the village site is on a spit that of course over the past few decades has um, been increasingly struggling with the rising sea levels and with uh, accelerated erosion to the point where the village uh, structures, the infrastructure was no longer um, stable and, and safe for life. But what so, so they, of course, pursued a, a multi-year relocation process and climate adaptation strategy. Um, the, the governor at the time sent some sandbags, which didn't even last one winter. Um, the lesser known story of Kivalina is that this community um, settled on, on the place that the village site is on. Um, only when they were coerced into doing so. And so this piece of land is not there, you know, it's within their ancestral region, um, but it was not a historic um, sedentary site. In fact, the nomadic community was approached by, um, if I remember correctly, it was the BIA, the Bureau of Indian Affairs, and told you can either settle and we will send a government school a mission, and we will contract missionaries to provide government schooling, um, or your children will be taken away from you and they will be forced into schooling without you. So you can either settle, give up your nomadic life ways, give up your subsistence practices as you knew them, um, settle into this ecologically unstable site, which of course, you know, however many decades after they would then have be having to advocate for millions and millions of dollars to relocate in a you know nearly decades long federal litigation or they would have their children taken away from them that was the option that they were given um and so even so obviously <laughs> it is a uh, um unfair deal to <laughs> say the least and to uh to censor the words I would rather use a little bit. Um, but it also shows the, the multitudes of approaches that are necessary to consider what is contributing to the climate crisis and what types of community-based, locally grown solutions will be necessary uh, to find stability again. Can you give me kind of a brief general rundown of what those 
community sourced based solutions might look like? And what what is the national and international kind of community missing and not hearing? Well, the second part of that question is is certainly the easiest answer and the first part is the most exciting to answer. Um, so often it, it, it is difficult to feel like we're not just yelling into the void um, in international negotiating spaces and, and slightly, slightly less so in some national circles. Um, what those places are, are missing is that all of the policymakers are elevating the voices of the most you know, powerful countries as measured by their GDP. There are so many problems in this system that obviously impede um, actual accountability from policymakers and even elected officials from answering true needs from the ground, especially seeing as in our global climate negotiations, polluters and corporations are given a extraordinarily large platform and disproportionately larger platform than frontline community voices are. So we see some of the biggest corporate polluters lobbying very effectively with all of their resources to continue their extraction endeavors or to ensure that they will have some new market solution that will uh, assure that they can still profiteer off of the climate crisis in some way. Um, so there is no uh, deep commitment to shifting our economy away from an extractive economy and towards a regenerative one. And I think that it means that our, our global climate negotiators simply don't have the courage um, but to to take bold action, the kind of bold and urgent action that our frontline voices uh, are demanding. And so from a negotiations perspective, it means that um, we have to continuously show up. We have to continuously bring the full, the, the, the full force of um, communities in coalition together, communities in solidarity from a global perspective um, to act um, in tandem with one another in these global spaces. And so that's why we see, um, you know, coalitions forming uh, between indigenous communities worldwide, between um, frontline advocacy organizations and grassroots organizations um, that are all, you know, preparing just as much as the policy writers are for these global, um, these global dialogues um, to ensure that it is our voices and our stories, uh, which of course are the most compelling um, that are also being reflected in, um, in policymaking. Um, but if we, and, and it is from, you know, an indigenous local perspective, it's just about the silliest thing that they're not, because something that we always um, remind ourselves of here is that we already have the solutions. We live for millennia in right relationship with our earth. Um, and so how do we take our cultural knowledges, how do we take our ancestral teachings and our imperatives from this earth, how do we take the knowledge hidden in our languages and in our arts and transform it not only into something that can and should be, be shared and taught, um, but something that can be reflected in policy writing. Um, and so that looks like not only you know, bringing, bringing voices into these dialogue spaces, but it means taking the real examples and lessons of ecological management and place-based knowledge um, to, to relocalize, right? So to look at ecosystems management from an indigenous perspectives and ensure that Fish and Wildlife Services or other national bodies are working in tandem with local indigenous communities to manage, um, to, to manage, you know, fishing quotas and, and um, hunting seasons and things like that. But it also means looking at the systems of reciprocity and community that sustained our, our peoples. And so thinking about what, you know, mutual aid networks can look like and um, what increased public health access can and should look like, what forms of education can be adopted to, um, to imbue a sense of personal and community responsibility and environmental protections. And so our, our indigenous solutions um, have been and will continue to be thriving. It's just a matter of scaling them, right? That, I mean, <laughs> perfect place to end. Um, 
Thank you so much for your time, um, your work, and we're wishing you just the best of luck with your continued um, activism. Thank you so much for this opportunity. I'm honored, honored and humbled as well.